In the second half of chapter 7, we're going to talk about how to assess normality. We don't always know when a problem is given to us or whether data is given to us, whether it is normal or not. All the things we've been doing in the previous video using the normal probability distribution is understanding that the data is already normally distributed and it's bell-shaped. What if we don't know that? Well, we can't use any of these methods until we prove that a data set is in fact bell-shaped and normal. A way to do that is using what's called a normal probability plot, which is a graph that plots the observed data versus the normal scores. A normal score is the expected z-score of the data value, assuming that the distribution of the random variable is normal. This score depends on the number of observations in the set, and they are used to assess the normality. For example, determine whether following normal, normal probability plot indicates that the sample could have come from a distribution that is normally distributed. You'll see down here we have the actual data, which ranges from, it looks like about 20, all the way up to about uh, 60 or 65. And then over here, is the percent, okay, or the expected z values. Now in order to be a normal distribution, all of the data points have to fall within these bands. These are called bands. And if all of the data points fall within those bands, then we could say that yes, this distribution is in fact normal. If any of the data points fall outside of those bands, then we would say, no, this is not normal. The data is falling outside the bands. In StackCrunch, this is called a QQ plot. I'll show you how to do one of these in a bit. Let's look at an example. I surveyed 40 students and asked them the time it takes to drive to Ivy Tech from home. And then I recorded the time in minutes in the table below. So in other words, I asked the first student, how long does it take you to drive to Ivy Tech from home? And he said, five minutes. The next person said, five minutes. The next person said, 22 minutes, and so on. And I recorded all 40 students' data points. Then we're going to create a normal probability plot to determine if this data appears to be normal by going to graph QQ plot. Then we'll calculate the mean and standard deviation. This would be really difficult to do by hand, so we're going to do all of that in StackCrunch. And then let's draw a normal curve and let's label it. So let's first determine whether this is normal. So I can't draw the normal curve until I have verified that this data is indeed normal does it have this bell-shaped curve associated with it. So let's first go to StackCrunch and do a QQ plot, which is this normal probability plot. Okay, so the first thing that I did is I typed all of the data into the first column over here, variable one. This is all of the times it takes um, to get to Ivy Tech from home. In fact, if I wanted to uh, create a table name over here, oh, I could do that. I could call this uh, time in minutes. Okay. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a graph QQ plot. So I'm going to go up here to graph and I'm going to come on down to QQ plot because that's the normal probability plot right there. And then I'm going to select the column from which I want to determine whether or not, this is a normal probability plot. And I'm not going to change anything else. I'm just going to compute. So there's my normal probability plot right there. Notice that it does not give you the bands, uh, but basically we're looking for somewhat of a straight line or linear approach. This does to be a straight line approach. There doesn't seem to be any curvature. Normally you'll, you'd see something that maybe starts low and kind of comes up and then curves off 
in some sort of a parabola fashion. This does seem to be a linear type of um, uh, model. So I would say that this appears to be fairly straight, which indicates that this is a normal distribution. For the second question on our lecture notes, it asks us to find the mean and the standard deviation. So let's recall how we did that with StatCrunch. So we're going to go to Stat Calculator, or excuse me, Summary Stats, my column. And when we do that, we're going to click, collect, click on the data value time, and we want just mean and standard deviation. Now notice there are two standard deviations if I haven't spoke about this before. There's this standard deviation and then there's also the unadjusted standard deviation. That is for population. So we don't want that one unless it specifically says this is coming from a population. So we're going to do the standard deviation up here which is the sample standard deviation. So let's go ahead and compute those two values, which are right here. So it says that the average time to get to IV Tech from home is 36.95 minutes with a standard deviation of 17.7. So let's refer, let's go back to the notes now and let's now draw the rest of our curve. Okay, so again, we answered the first two questions already. Given the QQ plot that we created in StackCrunch, it appears to be fairly straight, so therefore uh, we do think that this is definitely indeed normal. Then we also found the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, which is 36.95 minutes and 17.698 minutes. Now down below it's asking us to draw a normal curve and label. I would like you to pause the video and do that here. Remember you're drawing, now that we know it's normal, you're going to draw a bell-shaped curve. You're going to label the middle of the curve because now you know that the mean is 36.95. So the middle of the curve will be 36.95 and you know the standard deviation. So you know from that middle you're going to go out 17, 17, and 17 to find each of your deviations along the way. So I'd like you to go ahead and now draw that curve that will look something similar to what I have down here. So pause the video now. Okay, so now that you're back, um, I've already completed the rest of my graph here. Uh, you'll see that the average is 36.95 minutes, and I've got each of my standard deviations out to the right and to the left. You'll notice we do end up with a negative out here to the left, um, which actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense, so we'll address that, I think, on the next page. Okay. So now that we have the curve done, let's go ahead and answer some questions from the previous curve. Let's find the probability. I can actually put the curve on top here. Let's do it like this so we can see both. Okay? So we found the curve from the previous page, and now the first question says, find the probability that a randomly selected student drives at least 45 minutes to school. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, draw that on the, on the paper here. So the mean is 36.95, and I want to find at least 45. So 45 is going to be somewhere between here and here, so not too far from the mean. So here's 45 minutes, and at least means 45 or more. So I'm looking for this probability in here, which on my curve up here is going to be somewhere around here's 45, and I'm looking for all of the area to the right of 45. So in order to find that, I can use formulas or I can use StatCrunch for that. If I wanted to use formulas, let's go back and review how we did that. We're going to look for the probability that x is greater than 45, which means we first need to find a z-score. So in order to find that z-score, we have to plug it into the z-formula. So 45 minus the mean divided by the standard deviation and that's going to give us a z-score of 0.45. Now I'm going to go to the table and when I look up a z of 0.45 I'm going to get a z-score of 
6736. But now let's recall that this value is certainly not the small shaded area because I should get a number less than one half. Since I'm looking for the right side of a graph, I need to subtract the left side of the graph from one. This number right here is the left side of the graph. So to find the right side, I need to subtract that from one. So my probability is going to be 0.3264. Let's find the probability a randomly selected individual or student drives less than 10 minutes to school. Well, 10 is going to be off here to the left-hand side, so I'm looking for this probability in here. So the probability a student drives less than 10 minutes is the probability that the Z is going to be less than what number? So let's find the Z. So Z is 10 minus 36.95 over 17.698 and that gives me a z value of negative 1.52. When I look up negative 1.52 in the z table I find the probability is 0 0.0643. Find the probability that the random least selected student drives between 20 and 30 minutes to school. So here's the mean which is uh, 30, 36.95 and I want to find the probability that a student might drive between 20 and 30 minutes to school. So to look this up I first need to find the probability I need to find the probability that x is less than 30 and I subtract the probability that x is less than 20. I need to find the area between so I subtract the probabilities. So the first thing we need to do is turn those into z-scores. So to find the z-score of 30 I do the same thing I did up here by putting this into my z formula. You'll find the z-score of 30 is going to be negative point three nine the z-score of twenty is negative point nine six so when I look both of these numbers up in the table I find the probabilities are point three four eight three minus point one six eight five which gives me a probability of point one seven nine eight And lastly, if you were in the 20th percentile for driving time, so this time we're working backwards. It says I'm in the 20th percentile. So that means this probability right here is 20%. That's the probability. I need to work backwards to find out how long it takes me to get to school if I'm in the 20th percentile. Clearly it's less than the mean. Average is 36.95 so it takes me less time than that. But where exactly is that? So we gotta work backwards. Here's the probability. Remember to work backwards you go to the table, you look up the z-score, and then you turn that into an x. So let's first go to the probability table and find the probability that it's closest to 0 0.200. In between these, nope, 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 down here. In between these two values, 0.19 and 0.20, is where you're going to find 0.20. And I'd say it's closer to this value, which has a z-score of negative 0.84. So we're going to use a z-score of negative 0.84. So now we've got to find the x. Once we have the z-score, now we have to find the x. In order to find the x, we have to put this in the z formula. z equals x minus mean over standard deviation. Well, we have z. It's 0.84. We don't have x. We do have the mean, which is 36.95. Now 
we do have the standard deviation, which is 17.698. z equals x minus mean over standard deviation. So now we need to solve this for x. So multiply both sides by 17 and then add 36 and you're going to get this x value. So that means x then is going to be for this particular question approximately 22 minutes. Okay, so we got one last section to do, section 7.4, which is what we're going to do to finish up this chapter. And now we're going to talk about the normal approximation to the binomial. So this section is a little confusing at first because we're combining two different methods. So in the past we've talked about, uh, in chapter 6 I should say, in chapter 6 we talked about the binomial distribution. The binomial distribution is a discrete probability distribution where it has two and only two outcomes and its graph is a histogram because it's countable numbers. You can only have one, two, three, four, or five. You can't have anything in between. But now what if we want to have a binomial type of a problem but use the normal method since they're easy to approximate what the probability of a discrete variable might be. And we can do that, but it's going to be an approximation. You can't go between normal and binomial types of um, distributions without having some sort of an error in between. But we're going to do the normal distribution methods that we've just got done learning and we're going to use those methods to approximate a binomial type of a problem and note that it's going to be approximate answers. So let's go back to the binomial distribution for a minute. We know that we can use the binomial formula to compute probabilities but what if for example we have 500 trials and we want to compute the probability that we have 400 or more successes. In other words, that would be 400 and 401 and 402 and 403 all the way up to 500. There's no way by hand you would want to calculate all of those probabilities because you'd have to add them all together. This would take a very long time to do by hand because you'd have to add all of those individual little boxes from 400 all the way up to 401 to 402 to 403 all the way up to 500 and you'd have to add them all together. So this is where the normal distribution can actually help. If we connected all of those boxes together with this curve, we can get an approximation of the area of those boxes. Which graph is, comes from the binomial distribution? Well, the one that's squared off, this one, which I'll draw with uh, red. That's the binomial distribution right there. Now the continuous distribution would be this curve right here in green. Okay, because it's, it's continuous, meaning there are no bars. Are the areas under the curves identical? Well, obviously not. See, this red, air, this red area seems to be missing a little bit of area in the green curve, but the green curve seems to be missing a little bit area in this red box. So, but they are a good approximation, okay? Are they similar? Yes. I would say they're approximate areas are equal. The approximate areas are the same. Okay, so they will be similar in area size. So we're going to use the normal methods to approximate a binomial distribution. Okay, so first thing we got to define a couple things on the next page. So can we use the normal approximation, which is table 5, which we've been doing, 
to approximate a probability from a probability distribution. And to answer that, you have to be able to answer these tests in order to determine whether you can do that or not. So we need to determine whether it's normal first and then calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, in order to determine whether it is normal, we must prove this is true. If this is true, the binomial random variable x is approximately normally distributed. That's the first thing we need to do. After we determine that it is normal, we can use these normal curved methods. If this is not true, we cannot use the normal methods to approximate. Then we calculate the mean and the standard deviation based on these formulas here. Now, this method here talks about what's called the continuity correction, okay? Continuity correction. And what that is saying is if you look at one individual bar, like for example right here, okay? If I wanted to find the probability of just this bar occurring, we have to create a width. So we have to start just before the bar and end just after the bar to create a width for the bar. For example, if x is less than some value a right here, remember this is a binomial distribution. So this a actually has a bar. So if I want to include this whole bar A, I actually would go all the way over to just 0.5 above the A to include the whole bar. Same thing with this one down here. If this is the bar for A, and I want to find the probability that X is greater than or equal to, I have to include this whole bar. So that means I got to start at just 0.5 before the A, instead of after. So on each of the following pages, I'm going to be drawing these pictures and showing you where the 0.5 either is being added or subtracted by using what's called the continuity correction. We're going to have to add or subtract 0.5 from all of our questions on the next few pages. Okay, so here's some examples. In a Gallup poll, 37% of respondents said that if they had only one child, they would prefer it to be a boy. So you conduct a survey of 150 randomly selected students on your campus and find that 75 of them would want a boy. First of all, why is this a binomial distribution using discrete variables? Well, let's talk about the three things that are necessary in order to have a binomial distribution you need to have two outcomes. In this case, you only have two outcomes. Either they want a boy or not a boy, which in this case would mean a girl. You need to have a fixed number of trials. In this case, I do have a fixed number of trials. In fact, I'm conducting a survey of 150. Also, all of the trials need to be independent. And they are, because none of the people have, the, um, none of the probabilities of the first person wanting a boy has anything to do with the second person of wanting a boy. So each person asked is independent of the last. Is it feasible to calculate the probability that 75 of the 150 students would want a boy? So since this is a binomial distribution, let's quickly look at a curve. We know that you can have anywhere from 0 to 150 boys and the graph is going to have a bar for each one of those each one of those numbers. There's going to be 150 bars in here. And clearly I'm not even going to draw them all cuz it would take way too long. So picture 150 bars in here and I want to calculate the probability of at least 75 of them wanting a boy. So I have to color in 75 bars. Find the probability of each individual bar and then add all those bars together. So no, this is not really feasible because you'd have to calculate 75 times. And 
and sum them all up. Also, you couldn't use the tables because the tables only go up to an n that is 20. And clearly, I have an n that is 150. So not only could I do formulas, but I also can't do the tables because the tables don't go high enough in order to reach an n of 150. Now I could use StatCrunch, but we're going to pretend we don't have software. We're going to have to do this by hand, which means we're going to have to use the normal distribution in order to solve this. So in order to do the normal distribution, the first thing I need to do is calculate whether it is normal. So is it normal? If I can't answer this question, then I can't assume, I can't calculate this using normal methods. In order to know that it is normal, I have to determine whether n times p times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. Well, n is 150. p is the probability of success or probability of wanting a boy times 1 minus p, 1 minus 0.37, which is the probability of not wanting a boy, and is that greater than or equal to 10? Well, the answer is yes. So we can assume that this is approx this data is approximately normal, which means I can fit a normal curve to this data and use normal methods to solve this question instead of each of these individual bars. Of course, notice that this is going to be an approximation because those bars and that curve don't have exact areas. So first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to find the, the mean and then we're going to need to find the standard deviation. So in order to find the mean from the previous page, we found that the mean is equal to n times p. Well, there are 150 people that were surveyed and we know that 37% probably want a boy, and so 37% of the 150, we would expect 55.5 people to want a boy out of the 150. So this mean right here is going to be around 55. Notice it's not in the middle of 150. Now we need to find the standard deviation. Standard deviation from the previous page is n times p times 1 minus p all under the square root. Well, we already calculated that up here, so whatever answer you got up there is what we're going to put in here. So 150 times 0.37 times 1 minus 0.37. And we're going to get a standard deviation, don't forget to take the square root of all of that, as 5.913. Once we have the mean, which is right here, and then we know what the standard deviations are worth, we can use those two numbers to find any z-score to find any probability. So let's go ahead and calculate a couple of questions down here now that we have this information. Let's approximate the probability that in a random sample of 150 students, at least 75 would prefer a boy. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a curve, a better curve down here. Okay. So let's start with, actually I already have it drawn. Let me just show you what I have here, okay? So this curve right here is what I'm talking about. So I have all of the data ranging from zero all the way up to 150. We know that the mean where the peak is going to be is going to be at 55.5, that is the average. So that's going to be the peak, that's the most common um, the most common amount of people that I would suspect to have to want a boy out of the 150 people that I surveyed. Now of course there's lots of bars in between here. I didn't want to draw out all 150 bars of course. Now this particular question said what's the probability that in a random sample of 150 students at least 75 would want a boy? So I need 75 and 76 and 77 and 78, 79, all the way up to 149 and 150. I would need all of this area, all of these bars to be included. But the continuity correction says you can't include just the bar 75 without including all of the bar. The bar 75 actually goes from 74 and a half all the way up to 75 and a half. So if you want to include this bar, we actually have to back it up just a half of a space to 74.5. So to solve this question, 
in order to make it a discrete variable, we have to make it continuous. So using the continuity correction, I turn the probability that x is greater than 75 into the probability that x is greater than 74.5 because I had to back it up using the continuity correction to start it before the bar occurred. Then I turn this value into a z-score. So in order to turn it into a z-score, I take the value, which is 74.5, I minus the mean, which we found up here, divided by the standard deviation, which we found up here, and you get a z-score of 3.1, excuse me, 3.21. Now we go to that z-score in our table and we're looking for this area right here, okay? Remember, this is the right side of the graph. So whatever area I find is going to be for the left side of the graph, then I need to subtract that area from 1 to find the right side. So if I look up 3.121 in my table, here's 3.2, 3.20, 3.21 is this number right here, 0.9993. So in order to find, oops, excuse me. So in order to find that value, I gotta do 1 minus 0.9993. This was the number from the table. And that gives me a value of 0 0.0001. So this probability right in here is 0.0001. Seven. Does this result contradict the poll? Yes, because this is highly unusual. In the poll at the very beginning, it asked me, it said, um, to conduct a, a survey, oh, sorry, right here, at least 75 would prefer a boy, okay? Um, to find 75 people that would all want a boy would be unusual because it's less than 1%. Because most people, most people uh, do not want a boy. Only 37% want a boy. So to find the probability that at least half of them will want a boy is going to be very unusual because this probability is certainly less than 5%. Okay, on to the last page of the notes. We're going to do one more example using the approximation. According to American Airlines, flight 215 from Orlando to LA is on time 90% of the time. Randomly select 150 flights and use the normal approximation to the binomial. Again, n is so large that tables are not useful. And the equation is going to be quite enormous. So we're just going to use the normal approximation here to approximate what the binomial probability might be. So first thing we have to do is we have to determine whether or not we can actually use it. Okay. So first let's determine, can we? Okay. So in order to determine if we can, we have to first determine whether n times p times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. n is 150 fixed trials. The probability of being on time is 90%. The probability of being late is 10%. And yes, that is indeed greater than or equal to 10. So yes, we can assume this is normal. So now let's find the mean and the standard deviation. The mean is n times p. Standard deviation is n times p times 1 minus p. So now I'd like you to find these two answers. So pause the video and find them. Okay, so did you find these answers for the mean and the standard deviation? I found that the mean was 135 flights were expected to be on time with a standard deviation of 3.674. For the next question it says approximate the probability that exactly 130 flights are on time. 
Okay, so let's look at, let's just do it this way. Yeah, let's do it this way. Here we go. Let's find the, pro the probability that approximately 130 flights are on time. So first thing I did is I drew a picture because I do think that this helps in looking at what the answer is going to look like. So I know that the bar is going to be at 130 and I want exactly 130 and this bar because it's a binomial distribution or discrete variable does have width. It actually ranges from just prior to 130 to just after 130. So I would use the continuity correction to back it up a half and add a half. So this actually becomes the probability that Xn is between 129.5, which is going to be the left hand side, to 130.5, which will be the left hand side of this bar. So the whole bar has a width of 1. So the next thing I do is I find the z-scores for both of those values. So I found the z-score for this value because now I know that the mean and the standard deviation is, so I can find the z-score of both values. And then what I did is I plugged, I found both of those z-scores in the table and I subtracted those probabilities. So the probability that of the z-score of the larger number is going to be 0 0.1112 and the probability of this z-score is 0 0.0668. So when I subtract those two probabilities I find a probability of just shy of 5%. So slightly unusual that you'll find exactly 130 flights that are on time. All right, so for the next one, we're looking to find the approximation of the probability that fewer than 120 flights are on time. Okay, so fewer than 120 flights are on time. So again, I drew the picture. Here's 125 and I want less than that. So I did not include the bar of 125 because it says specifically fewer than 125. So we're not going to include that bar. So we're starting just to the left of that. We're actually going to start at this number right here, which would be 0.5 less than 125. So that's why I actually started my graph at 124.5. So what I did is I turned that x into a z-score by using the z formula. And then I looked up this z-score in the table 5 to find the probability, which is 0 0.0021. Now I realize I'm going a little faster on these last couple of questions because you could always pause this video and calculate the z on your own to make sure you get the same answer and also look it up in the table to make sure you're getting the same answer I am. Next question. Approximate the probability that at least 130 flights are on time. So here's 130 and at least means more than including the bar of 130. So I need to back it up to include this whole bar. I need to back it up all the way to this 0.5 correction on the left hand side of 130. So I'm going to actually start my graph at 129.5. So I'm going to pause this right here and I'm going to see if you guys can answer the question. If you know you're looking for the probability that x is greater than or equal to 30 and you know that you're actually going to start it at 0.5 earlier, I'd like you to turn this into a z-score and then look it up in the table and find that probability. So pause the video here. Hopefully you found the same values that I did. I found that the z-score was negative 1.5 and when I looked up that z-score in the table you got a probability of 0 0.0668. But that's just going to be the area on this left hand side way over here. I don't want this area on the left hand side. I want the area on the right hand side. So I had to subtract that value from 1. All right, on to the last question. What's the approximate the probability uh, that between 125 and 135 flights are on time? So here's my graph, 125 to 135. And we're going to include the bar 125, so we'll start just before it. We're going to include the bar of 135, so we'll end just after it. 
So we're actually going to start just before at 124.5 and end just after at 135.5. So this is the probability I'm looking for here. So I'd like you to finish this question. Look up, or excuse me, calculate both of these z-scores. Look up both the probabilities and subtract their values. So pause the video here. Did you get this answer? I found the z-scores of both of these values down below. And when I looked up these z-scores in table 5, I found the probabilities of each individually. And when I subtract those probabilities, I'll get the area in between, which is going to be 0.5536.